Thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure really for me to be here. First time in London. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you also, Astrid. I don't see you at the moment for organizing all this. Um, I'm thankful for everyone who's supporting this project, uh, who's helping me. Um, I see here in the back um, Ali Reza, who is bringing my books into Iran. Which is, um, as you all know, it's always working with Iran. It's not so easy. Um, I have a lot of people who support me, friends um, in Iran, outside of Iran. I'm, this project is my personal project in a way, and it is now my job. Um, but it wouldn't have been possible without all the people um, who really helped me um, bringing forward this. And of course also the people inside this book. Um, my talk tonight will um, cover slightly why I did this book, um, then uh, what is Persian design in general, um, and what holds the future. All the pictures you will see in the presentations, uh, presentation are pictures from our trip. Um, most of them are also in the book. In the book, there are way more. But so all the pictures you see here, um, they are from Iran, from the houses we visited. Um, of course, and this was goal, the goal of the book, um, it's not um, a scholarly book. Um, my reason was to show Iran on a, on a level almost everyone can understand, which is beauty, through the, the, the look of beauty. So um, I, we can talk way more about architecture and go into detail, but that was not the goal of the book, and that's why I, also the presentation will be like this. Um, as John said, we have the books on sale. And you can find the book also on Amazon and also on my website, which is lenaspat.com. Um, I know my name is always really hard to pronounce. <laughs> you can also just Google German book on Iran and you will find the book and the website. <laughs> it is that easy. Um, and for everyone who, in case, I just say in case, um, we don't have enough books tonight, um, but you would like to have a signed copy, uh, you can buy a book tonight. Um, I will send you one next week when I'm back uh, in Germany where I'm now living and we'll sign it and ship it directly to you. So, okay. Uh, that is strange. Sorry, before it was normal. Now I don't see it myself. Okay. Does it work? Right. Right. Everything was working fine before. Now we go. So here we go. So um, the agenda for tonight, after the presentation, also we will have a long question and answer. Uh, I'm really looking forward also um, to your questions and what you're interested in and your feedback. So the story behind the book is the first thing I will touch upon. Then what is Iranian interior design. Um, it is, of course, just um, shedding light on some aspects of interior design because it will be too complex to talk about everything. And then what holds the future for us? So do I. Um, of course, um, there were some personal reasons too. When I started the book, which was September 2016, so one and a half years ago, um, I had an interest always in interior design. I had, uh, um, or I was in a position to have some financial savings after working a couple of years. Um, got out of a job, and I wanted to work on Iran because when I studied Middle Eastern studies and finished, uh, it was the hate of sanctions. No one was doing business anymore with Iran. So after the Iran deal, I saw, okay, it's now easier. I can go back to Iran and do something, and I wanted to do my own project basically having my own business. Then, of course, um, as I said, I had the interest in interior design. There are books like my book, um, interior design, coffee table books, but usually they cover countries like Morocco, uh, India. We have a lot of books on in India, um, but we don't have a book on Iran, which was for me always strange because I travel, I do travel to Iran since 10 years now, and you have all this great architecture, of course, the mosque, everything, which is famous. Um, but I thought also there must be houses which are beautifully designed, um, a part of um, the, the public space. Um, 
one of the main reasons I wanted to do this book um, is I'm, I'm, of course, I'm a German, I'm a foreigner, um, so I'm aware of the, the image everyone has um, of Iran, because this is what, what people ask me when I say, yeah, I've been to Iran again. They're like, oh, why and what? And it's always the same topics you touch upon. And I, for me, it's an incomplete picture. Of course, these are all um, important topics, but I think it's just a tiny portion of what Iran is about. And for me, having also an emotional connection after going a lot to Iran, um, I also see the beauty of Iran and the positive topics. And there is not just design, I'm always saying there, you, someone can do, and pre, really if you know someone, just push the person to do it. Someone can do a book on fashion design in Iran. Um, still nomad people, I mean this is a topic also the average person would be interested, um, but we don't see that. Then the second one, and this is something I will also um, talk about later a little bit more. For me, us, right, the ones who know Iran in a way, either we are foreigners going to Iran or the Iranians who have the opportunity to live here or be here, um, kind of also have the duty to give something back to Iran. That's my personal view. I don't say um, everyone has to do that. Um, but for me, um, Iranians often, um, talking to me, have the, the lack of uh, self-confidence about Iran and what is Iranian. And for me, this was a topic to show, hey, you can be proud of what you have, the heritage, the culture, the, the architecture. Um, and at the same, one, the same time, it's something you should kind of preserve. Because we do see in Iran, of course, um, the artisans, like the, the workshops, they're dying out because people don't buy it because it's too expensive or it's, people just are not so interested in it anymore. The same about um, favoring new buildings over um, renovating the old ones. And this, the last point is actually something um, we can discuss about, but for me, um, architecture and design is a topic for business uh, opportunities in Iran, especially with a lot of foreigners come, or not a lot, but um, some more tourists coming in uh, everyone who works in renovation, um, local hustle business, these are opportunities and there is money you can make in Iran at the moment. So, to sum this up, uh, we have this little three mi uh, minutes video, which I will play you from someone who was with us on the trip. <laughs>
Oh, okay, sorry. This was supposed to work. What is Persian design? You saw already some of the um, houses we have in the book as examples. Um, Persian design, of course, is dominated by Persian architecture, which is, um, for, I see a lot of Iranians, and I guess um, a lot of you also uh, know about the influence of Persian architecture in the, in the entire Middle East. Um, what we see also with the houses in the book, um, the typical house made of mud. So we have earthy colors, um, mud being like straw, stone, um, clay, and then plaster work on top. This is something which is really the stereotype, if you can say, of a traditional Iranian house. Of course, making use also of wood. For example, here we see a like walnut door, walnut wood door, sorry. Um, and on the other side, a typical Iranian um, window, which is called Orsi, so with the um, different glass, stained glass. Then, something which is important in architecture and also in interior design, the, the geometry. So, Iranian architecture is kind of simple, but always on like grand scale. So we have the arc, of course, we have the domes, which we saw also in the video before. Um, a lot of things we see on religious buildings, tea houses in Iranian architecture, we see also in private houses. And then is something, um, as Iran has been a country of uh, fire worshippers, so, um, Zaytoshti, or I can never pronounce the English word, so I think for Zoroastrians or something like this. <laughs> um, light is really important. Light in Iranian architecture and light also, I mean, in general, in interior design, also in the Western interior design, is important because we need light to fill it with life. Um, in Iran, even more, as two thirds of Iran, uh, the Iranian soil is desert. Um, it is even more uh, important. So in summer, it becomes unbearably hot. So we have the typical Iranian courtyard house has a winter side and a summer side. Traditionally, people were moving from one side to the other. On the other hand, also, what I will talk about now, the, what's this? Here you see one example. Um, for the ones who have been to Iran, I mean, this is, is, is uh, standard. Um, but of course, it, it mm, is important for the construction of windows. So in Iran, we have on the left side, this is a um, uh, so-called PC um, constructed house. So it's just rent earth. Basically, it's a really primitive way of building houses. Um, but a window, I would say, pretty um, similar to the windows we know. But then, of course, we have a lot of skylights in Iran. And Iranian architecture always tries to um, close the gap between the earth and like the heaven where I mean it has the religious background so um, the skylight basically reaches out to to God uh, this is a house in Tehran the, yeah. um, the, the lightning is a bit different on the screen uh, it's a bit overexposed but it's a house from around 100 110 years ago so you already see it's well um, more advanced. These ones, is, I would say, what Iran is famous for and what Iranian uh, tourists to Iran are always like, wow, that's amazing. Um, so lattice worked windows. This is all wood in between our, um, uh, is, our gla is glass. The same here. This is um, all glass in between. and. Same on the left, and the left is a really good example for Iranian architecture. If you um, have the chance to read into the book, the introduction is written um, by um, Mohammed Beheshti, who is in oh, everything. He's one of the also um, directors of the Iran Heritage Foundation, and he actually talks in the introduction about 
Iranian um, interior design being so different to the Western one because the architecture itself is already so much decor. So you basically, what we do in, in Western interior design is we have a white room, empty room, and we put things inside. In Iranian interior design, it's way more um, keeping in mind that you already have here these amazing windows. Then you have what we call the bayanas, um, honeycomb walls, I don't know how to, to say it in English. Um, which already, like, everything up here is so impressive that you can't do, like, a lot of lighting, um, different um, lanterns. So you kind of have to reduce to give a nice design. Interesting for me, we have in this book, we don't have only these traditional courtyard houses or desert homes, we also have modern houses. And even... In the architects of these houses, they use like windows in a different way, like the round ones uh, here um, on the left ones. They're, they, they're kind of out of the grid, um, which makes again or shows how important the light is and how we, we diffuse also the light. Lighting in Iran is barely um, like straight, it's always kind of a warm and non direct light. This, that's also why we have a lot of lanterns. For the left one is a really old one. And this actually is it's not original. It's a um, remake of uh, Shahnaz Nader, who's one of the great interior designers. Um, and of course, the oil lamp, which has always been there in Iran, and the um, tulip, so lale for the Iranians, um, tulip shaped, also candlestick. This is one of the great examples of Esfahani, so um, a metal work from Esfahan. On this image, um, I don't know if it's, it's obvious, but this lantern is around two meters high, so it's really huge. Um, and then, of course, the, the forms it creates at night on the walls, it's like, it's kind of a dancing uh, disco ball, um, just that this lamp is more than two meters so. The same again going into the modern, like a combination of Iranian tradition with modern design. You see like on the right side, everything is really minimalistic and clean. And in these, um, the furnishing here is like um, out from outside of Iran. But still it's kind of some simple, it's, it's not really, oh, how it works, yeah. Um, it's not overloaded. It, works well with the, the arts, the architecture you have here in this uh, older house. The left one is again the one in Tehran, which is belonging to a designer um, who is pretty also known in Tehran. And he designed everything you see here, a part of the billiard, uh, the pool table, um, is done by himself. The same for the lamp. So um, that's a typical, uh, he reuses material, Iranian material. Um, I won't go too deep into this, but of course, in Iranian interior design is dominated by tiles. We, I mean, I guess even those who haven't been to Iran, when you think of Iran, you think of these huge domes with uh, Turkey's um, uh, tiles or tile work, uh, similar to the arabesque ones here. So we see this on the walls, on the floors, everywhere. Something um, which is not so known here, I would say, um, is mirror work. And for me, mirror work is a good example to show what I was also wanted to do with my book besides showing great design is telling stories. And um, the story of mirror work was for me new when I read about it. Um, but I think it's interesting just to know that um, when glass was imported into Iran from, from Europe, on the way back in the days, back in the uh, 16th, 17th century, a lot of glass was breaking. So what would you do with the glass? You had to reuse it. And basically out of this, Iranian um, artisans created mirror work. Because, yeah. It also gives a, not, uh, a really nice um, meaning, again, to light, especially this one here. You see basically the, the combination of this great tile work on the floor 
and the mirror on the on the ceiling, which is like the light and the tiles are reflected in the mirror work. This is like a really a great example of a traditional house in, in Esfahan, now done in a mix of traditional and modern design. As I mentioned before, of course, um, we have on one hand the earthy colors in Iran, also because of the material we find. But on the other hand, we also have the contrast. So in tiles, um, we have, of course, the, the seven colors starting out, out of this. Um, we have contrasting colors. This house is a nice example of sorry, something new. Um, because the owner is a lady living in between Iran and um, Ibiza. So you see the influence of uh, Spanish colors. The house is a Safavi house. Uh, we also have one house which is like a Hosjone, so the, uh, the pool house, um, which is total Iranian, but then you step out and you're again in a turquoise uh, room. The same here in this house, um, which is not that old. And so Safavi house meaning um, the other one is uh, almost 400 years old. Um, this house is just a bit more than 100. But again, you see the, the wood here, the chairs, which are also actually imported into Iran, um, which is again part of Iranian history, now in different colors. Um, and here, this is a corsi. Uh, the Iranian traditional way of heating a room was not heating the entire room, it was just heating a blanket which was put on top of a little table and then you crawl underneath it. Um, it's actually now back like en vogue in, in traditional hotels in Iran and a lot of foreigners love it. One of the um, things we of course have to talk about when talking about interior design is furniture. And especially in Iran, some people say, your book is not on Iranian interior design. And I'm like, well, why? It's like, because we don't have furniture in Iran. That's the way like, Iran is. Um, for me, it's a really narrow-minded view. Uh, it's also, it's of course on one hand true that Iranian architecture or Iranian furniture is already in line in the architecture. So as you see here, the typical shelf built into the wall. Um, in the middle, a um, new interpretation where we have out of the rubble, someone renovated the house. They built basically the sofa, and on the left, plaster work made already the, the lighting. Um, this is true, but I do think that we, we have we seen Iran not just since the last, uh, well, let's say since the beginning of the 20th century, we don't see furniture. We know that there have been chairs already back in the uh, Achaemenid's times, so, which is more than yeah, 2,000 uh, years back. And of course, also the, the French influence is part of Iranian history. If we want or not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we do have French-influenced furniture. We have Art Deco in the um, furniture. We have... I mean, who knows Iran through the normal, let's say normal Iranian houses, not the nicely designed ones, knows that we find a lot of uh, baroque uh, furniture in the usual Iranian house, which is not comfortable. It just looks uh, every the same. And then, of course, nowadays, uh, we do have the imports from China, so the typical uh, garden furniture in Iran is plastic chairs. Um, but we also have people who reuse, and it's, a, it's why I did this book also, it's a new start and it's still a trend which is small, but people reuse Iranian furniture, like, for, uh, like the tah, so a day bed, I always call it, uh, which is now transformed into a sofa, so people have it indoors, they put nice cushions on it. That's actually what it is. This is the Hotel Manucheri. Um, Tahts have always been there. Um, de developed from the, the throne, do you say that? Yeah, Game of Thrones, yeah. The throne of uh, like the, the Persian kings. This is now kind of the outdoor day bed in the Hotel Manichetti. The um, chest is, is something really typical in Iran. This one is made of wood and then we have velvet on top. 
tables made of wood. Iran has a great, I don't know for, for those who, who haven't been to Iran, um, we have a big forest in the north of the country. <clears throat> also this one, for example, is a new one. It's below, it's, it's wood. And then on top we have the cushions covered also in the um, hand printed material or textile. Here you see, for example, the French influence on both sides, actually, which is like the fusion of modern and traditional. Here, also interesting, the tiles, which the owner designed himself. Um, it's the same room as we have, seen, like here, with the bed. For example, this one is, you see, this is, of course, not typically Iranian. Um, the huge bathtub in the middle, um, that's a uh, new design. But on the, on the same side, or the, at the same moment here, we see behind these glass windows, we have a wardrobe. So they use the, the traditional architecture for their own purpose, like having a walk-in closet, basically. Something Iran can be proud of. <laughs> uh, after India, the, Iran has the biggest diversity of handicrafts. I just took here some. Um, there are way more in Iran, and this is actually what, in the beginning, got me started on interior design in Iran and architecture. Um, it is decor, um, ceramics in every house, in every house these uh, portrayed in my book. We find ceramics. Be like here in the middle, these huge casser bowls, or the small ones, um, hand drawn, or the industrial version, which is like back in the days. Um, the the Persian word is now um, Chinese um, service. Uh, what, what, what? Golisor, Golisor. Golisor. Um, and nowadays it's a really cheap version, but still everyone loves it, and even young people now buy it. Metalwork, um, which is for me one of the, I'm sorry that it's always in this, um, one of the really interesting parts here is on this side, these are religious objects. We do see them now out of context, just used as design objects. For example, this is the house of Morteza Dalbari in Tehran, and he used the alam, which is like the usually used for. Um, processions, religious processions in Iran. He used this also now in another restaurant he designed where he was not sure how long he could put it there because it's kind of still sensitive topic to use something. It's huge also, it's like two, three meters. Um, religious, just for decor. Textiles is a really nice topic. Um, Someone is actually working in Kashan um, at the moment on a museum on, on textiles. Kashan has been a center of um, uh, velvet production and also silk. It's, it was kind of dying out. Um, it's now private people who, who took over and who, for example, in Hotel Manichetti established a workshop where you can see how people weave it. On the left side, um, Something which is also now really, you see it a lot in these nicely designed houses, of course, again. Um, a hordin, so it's a saddlebag, usually used for every animal, from small to big. Um, then it, it went on to motorcycles in, in now today's Iran. And now people also use it, like here on, the, on a small stool, but also on, in the television room. You put just the, the um, controls into it, or magazine, something like it has been there always in Iran, but it's just new, um, used in a new way. For those who, who know Iran here, again, the um, hand-printed <laughs> cotton, and on the left, something which is, um, yeah, this is, a, is an antique piece. It's, it's really uh, appreciated. Um, it's needlework from the Kerman region. Um, yeah. It's, it's just one of the examples we have here. And of course, and I don't want to go into detail because the Persian rug, everyone knows about the Persian rug. Of course, and in my book also that was the, um, my goal to show, was to show that we don't have only these red traditional um, 
rocks from Iran because I think this is the, the image Western people have when they think of Persian rock. The diversity is huge. Um, but here I like also that we use it in a different way. That's a um, des central desert in Iran and basically they do here. It's a private house to do sometimes music or just watch the stars. From there we have also Kilims, of course, is a, again a really nice example. Um, or here, that's something I have never seen somewhere else. It's a bathroom that someone uses a Persian rug as basically a sort of the bathroom is still something I think uh, Iranians feel like, oh no, the, per the Persian carpet, you can't do this to a carpet. But I really liked it. Something which is, um, because of the um, progress we made in Iranian contemporary art, um, something we saw all over these houses is people use Iranian art as decor. Be it also the traditional one, this one is um, the reverse glass painting. for the Iranians. Um, of course, also it's, it's calligraphy. Um, and here, for example, this is a really known artist um, who does sculptures. The themes we see is arabesque, of course. Um, bead on tiles, bead on also chairs, which is uh, something new. And nature. In um, the last time I was in Iran in November, actually, I went to the bazaar in, in Shiraz, and I s heard someone just asking everyone for carpets. <coughs> this, like this one, is a is a line, um, the sheer. And but it's an antique uh, one. It's actually a travel bag. But someone asking only, I want all the carpets which have like kind of this simple line on it. Wanted to buy everything they had. It's kind of again now a trend, um, but it's it's a it's a modern house, and I think we see that we'll see this more and more that something which is Iranian becomes a trend in, in a certain group of people um, in Iran or in Tehran especially. Of course, of course, um, Golomor, the typical um, bird and flowers, and then geometry, which I touched upon already, talking about architecture in general. But we see this also with furniture the use of simple geometric forms. So what's next? Um, I guess you, you can feel that I'm talking really positive about Iran and all we had and have, and I think there are a lot of possibilities. Um, of course, um, we do need to keep in mind that we have some challenges. Um, Especially after the recent protests, I guess everyone knows we have some economical challenges in Iran. So um, most of the people who also are portrayed in the book are coming from a certain class, social class. We don't, it's, it's not a documentary um, on how Iranians live. Um, these are people who, a part of one person, all have been outside of Iran. So they have experienced um, what design outside of Iran is. And they, of course, have the, the means also to buy, for example, antiques, like what I said about the carpets, uh, the travel bag. All these things, are they are expensive and also handicrafts are expensive. Um, we do have the educational challenges. So far, for example, you can in Tehran, you can study interior design as a master at Danish uh, Tehran, Tehran University. Um, but in other art universities, you can just study architecture and then you will study Islamic architecture. Um, and we do, and I saw this while producing the book, which is architecture is building, like building buildings. There is no thought spent on, okay, the interior, what, how do we want to decorate it? The whole thought, when I said I'm doing a book on interior design, they were like, oh yeah, architecture, there are nice houses in this, it's a museum. I was like, no, no, it's about inside the house. That's really, I would say, an educational and um, cultural challenge at the same time. Um, that's also said on the, on the cultural part. Uh, of course, talking about the mix of Iranian traditional design and modern. Um, it's kind of something innovative, which... So far, we don't see a lot in Iran. 
unfortunately, it's either you follow the sonati, the traditional path, or path, or you go for modern, and modern meaning Western. Um, so we do have the, the challenge of people who think in a new way, people who want to co combine both um, to, to really see a, let's say, a big wave of, of good design in Iran. And of course, also saying, keeping in mind that uh, you need to, to experience design or to um, create good new design, you need also a certain surrounding. Um, you need role models. And Iran, unfortunately, the, the government is a bad example of design. If you walk into, into a, an office building, if you, as I mentioned, the museums, if, it is a shame like how a lot of um, traditional houses are just not, they're museums, they're empty, there's not so much done. Um, I always say I think the young people would be, um, would be able to connect with the tradition more if these houses would, be, would have a usage for them in their daily life. So if, for example, a traditional house would become a cafe, and I mean, this is happening, especially in Tehran, it's, it's happening more and more, um, but also a co-working space, a hotel, and, but these initiatives are mostly coming from pri private people, so it's not so much the government. But where my hope is coming from, um, as I said, also coming from the tourism, um, we have business opportunities and, of course, coming from a certain group of affluent people in Iran who want to, or it can basically trendy at, at some point, and it still is, to buy old houses, renovate them. Um, so there is money to make for those people who renovate these houses and also design them in, inside. Um, and there is money to make in tourism. And, of course, tourists also bring new ideas. Tourists ask for the, they want the local, the real unique experience and they don't want the kind of, um, the, for example, tourists nowadays, they complain about going to an Iranian bazaar and seeing all these um, Chinese goods and not handmade Iranian ones. <clears throat> then I see that um, starting, I would say, perhaps in the last, yeah, during the last 10 years, um, made in Iran and the Iranian identity became cool in the sense it started with fashion, um, with the girls. We all have to wear the, the of course, the hijab, the, um, the whale. <laughs> um, and so we started, and also the manto, the, the long um, tunica, or whatever you want to call this, um, this became a little bit like Iranized, Islamized. Um, and it became cool to have some calligraphy on top or something like this. And from there, it went off the trend also to furniture, um, to in general handicrafts. So I do think this will become more and more. And we saw, for example, the, the Friday Bazaar and all these um, yeah, places where they sell handmade things. They, they become more and more, especially in Tehran. Um, and then one th good thing, um, the first high-quality interior design magazine, um, and I can really say um, high-quality. Unfortunately, I don't have any left because I had some before. It's called Manzel. Um, whoever goes to Iran or has someone going to Iran and is interested, just ask the person to bring um, one, one copy because it's really... It's no blurry pictures, it's good layout, <laughs> which for everyone who knows Iran is already a, a great step. And they, they do promote it a lot. And I know that, for example, the website, they have 400,000 people using the website. So it's becoming more and more. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. If you, um, like after this presentation, you will have time for questions and answers. Um, I'm really delighted to hear all what you are interested in and I'm, I'm happy to answer every question. If not, you can also always send me an email at hello at lenaspa.com. Um, I answer um, every email or you can follow me what I'm doing. Instagram is always the you know, most up-to-date version, also when I'm traveling in Iran. Um, new houses, which I will um, definitely visit in, in the upcoming, or in this year, not the upcoming, this year. Um, 
are always also on Instagram and you can sign up for newsletter online or here. You also have it here later on. And of course, as I mentioned, you can buy the book on linashbat.com. We ship everywhere. We ship to Iran. Uh, we have an Iranian bank account. You can tell your Iranian friends. Um, and thank you so much for listening to my presentation and also coming here and spending your time with us. Merci. That's the